pacemakers pacemakers the single chamber one dual chamber one so crt so what is crt actually standing for so crt actually stands for cardiac resynchronization therapy so most often it is used for the heart failure but i will also try to show you what are the implications associated with it so if in simple words someone is going to ask what is crt actually so crt is like a triple chamber pacemaker so as you may see this is like a this is in the RA this is in the right ventricle and here comes the third uh, chamber which is being paced so most commonly this is the one which is there in the left ventricle so these are the subheadings through which I'm going to speak about so you are very much now aware so this is being used for the heart failure actually but other than CRT as well, there are some other devices which is used in heart failure. What is the other common devices? A uh, ICD. So ICD is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So in fact, what happens is there are several patients who have already recovered from the ventricular arrhythmias which have caused instability. And in fact, if you expect those patients to at least live more than one year, with good functional status, they are the class 1 indications, in fact. So that is what is called as the secondary prevention, okay? So someone has already had an episode and then you're trying to prevent. So then something else is called as primary prevention. So in primary prevention, what happens is, you're trying to, uh, so you have already seen that, you know, the heart failure is there in class 2, 3, NIHA, okay? And the ejection fraction is, of course, less than 35%. Okay, so, but one of the important conditions is you have already optimized, optimized the medical therapy you have tried to see, you're not able to make a big difference, in fact. So, in that, one more thing you should try to rule out, you should not implant this device within 40 days of the prior myocardial infarction. So, because during that time, the risk for having all these heart problems is pretty high. So this is one of the reasons, okay? And so, uh, in fact, oh, oh yes, uh, as I already said it as well, similarly, if someone is already in class four, Niha, okay? And uh, so ICT is actually not uh, required. Rather, you should try to consider those patients for the CRT or assist device or even for cardiac transplantation in fact do you understand and yes um, similarly if you're trying to replace the generator and all you should try to look carefully so now coming to our main goal what we are trying to discuss about is the CRT when do you give them for patient with heart failure so several conditions are there, several conditions in the sense, QRS width, more than 150 milliseconds, left bundle branch block has to be there, ejection fraction is less than 35%, even after the optimal medical therapy you have already given, okay, and you are trying to improve, of course, the, not only the symptoms, but also the reduce the morbidity and mortality, in fact, <laughs> however, if there's another patient with the yes, SQRS more than 150 milliseconds, patient fraction is 35. But if it is non left bundle branch block, it is a class 2A indication. So it is not the ideal indication. Similarly, if the QRS width is like 130 to 149 means not so wide, still a left bundle branch block. Then, what you try to, as I said it, if it is not so wide, ejection fraction is less, LBVB, so it is 1B, okay? So 2B is, of course, the non-LBVB, in fact. And then, one of the other important things is, so, there's already a, uh, so what happens is, if there's a, patient with reduced ejection fraction in spite of the NIHA class and it needs the patient needs ventricular pacing 
and there is a high degree AV block. So CRT can be considered. Okay. So what happens is if there is a pacemaker candidate, but what happens is, uh, yeah, there is a high degree AV block. Okay. And you want to pace as well. And there is a reduced ejection fraction. So for that, it doesn't matter. Whatever may be the class, you should try to pace them, in fact. Do you understand that? So this is important. And yes, always remember, narrower the QRS, it's not a, a good sign. So for example, if it is the QRS is less than 130 milliseconds, it's not a good indication, in fact, for that. So what if a patient comes to you, heart failure patient comes to you with bradycardia? How are you going to manage them? So you should try to see is the pause is, is more than three seconds, okay, and the resting ventricular beat is less than 50, uh, 50 beats per minute. Otherwise, in sinus rhythm is up to 50 beats per minute. Otherwise, in, fip, in if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, you have to see if it is up to 60 beats per minute. If that is how it is, okay, so you have to pace such kind of patients. Similarly, if there is a patient with reduced ejection fraction, and yes, there is a high degree AV block, so for such kind of patients, rather than considering RV pacing, you can directly go for the CRT as well. Okay. Even uh, so, what happens is, um, uh, if there is a again a patient with reduced ejection fraction, even if the patient doesn't have high degree AV block, and you want to end avoid the ventricular dyssynchrony, yes, it becomes like class 2A indications for such patients. Similarly, so what are the comorbid conditions, okay, in which it is not indicated? So, for example, if someone has a sleep apnea, it's not good to give them. Otherwise, similarly, in diabetes patients and all, you should try to avoid giving them uh, glitter zones. Why? Because they are the ones who can worsen the heart failure. Similarly, for the arthritis patients, non-SEDs or the COX-2 inhibitors are, should be avoided, in fact. Okay. And then, the uh, now, there are different societies which have already advised for the usage of CRT. So, what should be done? So, what happens is, uh, the Heart Failure Society of uh, America has already said it. Um, yes, you must give it to them in spite of like if the patient is in knee heart 2 or 3 and the ejection fraction is less than 35%, sinus rhythm or QRS is within 150 milliseconds and not due to RBVB, yes, you should give them. Similarly, the American Heart Association or the Heart Rhythm Society as well, what we already spoke about it. There is not much of a difference, in fact, okay? So the main thing is wide QRS, ejection fraction less than 35%, and left bundle branch block. So indeed, left bundle branch block is a, uh, one of the universally accepted definitions for its indication. And the RV pacing-induced left bundle branch block is considered as a substrate for poor mechanical function and also remodeling so we already said it other than this the left motor branch in fact females tend to respond much better and if someone is having a relatively normal left atrial size or body mass index as well and in fact there are various studies which have supported the use of this so what are this so uh, so what happens is yes um, we do come across permanent AF in those up to one third of one third to one fourth of these CRT patients. So let's try to go through some of those studies. What did they say? So raft study, which included one of the maximum number of permanent AF studies. However, it uh, you know it was it failed 
to demonstrate a clear improvement in any of the conditions with permanent AF. Yes, uh, the heart failure reduction or heart failure hospitalization was reduced. But of course, how can it be helping for the AF? It can't, right? So what happens is uh, the problem, what was said that because those patients were AF, so that's why there was suboptimal delivery. In fact, only one third of the patients received like really good, uh, which is more than 95% ventricular piercing. So in fact, uh, what was suggested is that if you ablate the AV node, you can increase the uh, pacing for such kind of patients. Similarly, in San AF study, so what they tried to do was, they tried to do a CRT and AV nodal ablation. And it really showed there is a significant reduction in all-cause mortality for these patients as well. So there was a study in which they tried to see can you give uh, CRT for the narrow QRS? However, so what the problem was, no. There's no benefit at all. So in fact, the ESC guidelines clearly says if it is less than 120 or 130, you should not give at all for this kind of patients. So these are some of those electroanatomical models which you can see how for the basis of the QRS width when it was how the propagation tends to happen of the pacing when it is being paced over here. So one of the important concepts which we all should be really clear is the mechanical dyssynchrony and versus mechanical discoordination. So these two are very different concepts. Different concepts in the sense mechanical dyssynchrony is defined as an increased time delay between the peak of shortening or tissue velocity between the various LV wall regions, most commonly LV lateral and the septal wall. So do you understand? So they are trying to differentiate between the LV lateral and the septal wall. So due to the shortening of the tissue velocity between the various LV walls. However, for mechanical dyssynchrony, there's time to peak delay. Time to peak delay in the sense. So that's why uh, some of those uh, investigators propose parameters like cure index, internal stretch fraction, systolic dyssynchrony index and also septal boundary index. So what was happening is if you give CRT, it is not the cure okay, for such kind of patient. So what you need to do is uh, sometimes there may be something is called as non-responders as well. So non-responders like you have put up the device but nothing is still happening in a positive way. So what you do is for such patients is uh, because you are trying to do pacing in a scarred region, okay, which may provide inadequate resynchronization because of the slow conduction, of course, in that area. So, for example, if some there is a patient who is already having a posterolateral scar, try to avoid uh, that can increase the chances of the patient being a non-responder. Similarly, if there is a possible arrhythmogenic effect. In the sense, if you have done a cardiac MRI and there is a scar, uh, myocardium is there. So it will five times increase the chances of sudden cardiac death or even the failure of this. Similarly, if uh, you observe mid-wall fibrosis, so mid-wall fibrosis is commonly seen in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. So again, it is going to further increase the morbidity and mortality as well. <laughs> In fact, in the patients with whom initial CRT response was poor, and if you try to put another LV lead in combination with the RV pacing, so this is called as triventricular pacing. So there was already a RV lead, there was already another LV lead, but what you do is you put another LV lead and then you try to pace them, you see the results tend to significantly improve. This is a forest plot trying to show so how 
it has been benefiting in fact so the lv endocardial pacing so what had been happening is when they tried to study the lv endocardial lead which is being applied using a transatrial septal puncture so you puncture the septum put up additional lead through the mitral valve into the lv endocardial pacing okay and uh, so what is happening is we are still also waiting for more results as well so one of the other important things is just implanting a device for a patient is not enough you should be able to optimize so how you do the optimization so that's why a lot of times they have those heart failure clinics in which you try to do is there is a heart failure nurse for that uh, there are the so, so the patient will go to going ecg uh, ecg in the sense like on and off magnet biventricular pacing and if the patient develops any arrhythmias as well you do a chest x ray you also try to do a lab tests for the blood count electrolyte and also renal panel similarly you can also try to do what is called as cycloergometric test cycloergometric tests in the sense you try to see how is the oxygen uptake and the biventricular pacing especially during the exercise and you try to integrate the device you also uh, try to see for example uh, there should be a designated cardiologist who is going to review those patients in the meantime get a echo done and after all these things you try to interpret the results then on the basis of that you try to do a device optimization or the if there is any really need lead repositioning and of course followed by medical optimization dietary consult or even heart failure education